Good morning. Uh, we are opening the panel dedicated to the neighborhood of European Union, eastern part of the neighborhood of European Union and southeast. Uh, this is part of the European Union that is frequently uh, branded as in flames uh, due to the difficulties and challenges that uh, countries in that part of the European Union faced for decades by now. But here we are today to discuss what is the way forward, what is the way for stabilization, but even more so, what is the way of successful pathway of European integration of countries that are in the neighborhood of the European Union. Today, we are joined by excellent speakers in this panel whose experience uh, has no match in, in terms of uh, global experience as well as experience in the region. We have here today uh, at the panel three former uh, presidents from the European Union, from the members uh, of European Union, but personalities that have played a great deal of deal in terms of advancement and development of not only the enlargement policies of the European Union, but then of the neighborhood of the European as well. Uh, we have uh, today here uh, the former presidents of Latvia, Bulgaria and Croatia. Um, I would like to start uh, our conversation from Her Excellency Mrs. Vaira Vaike Freibergam. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Eastern, Eastern neighborhood of the European Union. And then uh, perhaps I'm biased myself with the Eastern uh, part of the European Union being Georgia and myself. But uh, we have had a recently dramatic escalation of uh, security environment in the region with the dramatically increased military presence of the Russian Federation in the neighborhood, specifically uh, in the vicinity and of, the, of Ukraine and inside of Ukraine in the uh, currently occupied region of Crimea. But security related challenges of the region of the region are just one component of the overall challenges, obviously, that we'll face on the pathway of further approximation and eventual, as we hope, integration to the European Union. If I would ask you this question, now that we are hopefully coming out of the COVID crisis, what do you see are the key priorities for European Union in, in its attempt to try to help recovery of the European Union, or Eastern part of the neighborhood of European Union in terms of economic recovery of, of all the countries that are part of the neighborhood in this direction of geography of the European Union. But when it comes to the strategic vision of the European Union, would you uh, assess it that it's clear or it's still in the process where there are too much of diversities among the members of the European Union of what the future of uh, Eastern neighborhood countries is to be when it comes to its relationship with the European Union. May I start with defining a few terms? First of all, when we talk about the East, it turns out we mean a great many different things. After all, we live on a planet as uh, to their cost scientists discovered was round uh, and uh, depending on where you stand uh, the same direction could be east for one and west for somebody else. The, uh, the European Union uh, has borders of which Latvia happens to have the outermost eastern border uh, along with our immediate neighbors. Uh, so that from where Brussels stands, or indeed any part of uh, the European Union stands, the eastern border uh, of the Latvian Republic is uh, the outer eastern border or part of it of the European Union. Therefore, when we talk about the eastern neighborhood, obviously it is the one that is beyond our eastern borders or if you like beyond the northeastern borders of the European Union. However, I might add uh, that in relation to your question, I think it would not hurt for Europeans as a whole, uh, both from north, south, east and west, to have a clear idea of what it means to belong to the European Union and to have less, uh, put, put less emphasis uh, on these cardinal uh, directions of the compass 
and to try and describe uh, the challenges that the union has to face uh, in a solidary uh, and, and cooperative manner, uh, attributing them to saying, oh, uh, you know, there are differences uh, uh, between the parsimonious uh, uh, North uh, with its Protestant ethic and so on, and the spendthrift South uh, who just like to live a good life, or uh, some would say, uh, Eastern Europe is slipping away from democracy as if Western Europe was such a shining example of perfect democracy, neither of which is true. Uh, and by the way, when we think of the division between East and West, what we are thinking of is the historical Iron Curtain that used to divide the European continent for half a century. That obviously has left very deep marks, deep marks on the European psyche both those on the east side and the west side of it. And uh, let us not forget that what is now uh, the Federal Republic of Germany was once uh, split up into four occupation zones, the largest of which was the Russian occupation zone. I, as a refugee child from Latvia, living in refugee camps in Lübeck, was living for part of my childhood only a couple of kilometers away from what was the border between East and West Europe. And that was on the outskirts of Lübeck, which is in Schleswig-Holstein, and which now, if you look at the map, is in the very heart of Europe. It's nowhere in East. But it was the border with Eastern Europe in terms of the separation between democratic countries on one side and uh, the um, those behind the Iron Curtain on the other side. When uh, the European Union had its large uh, first uh, big enlargement beyond the three neutral countries, uh, Sweden, um, Finland and Austria that were admitted in the early 80s, um, there was uh, hesitation uh, about how far east the European Union could afford to go uh, without a uh, compromising uh, its own integrity uh, and its own cohesion, but most of all, uh, out of fear of how Russia would react to what they still uh, rather sheepishly accepted as the sphere of influence of the former Soviet Union. And of course, when the three Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, uh, became uh, members uh, in May of 2004, what we had been doing as, as political work of, of campaigning uh, had been centered, certainly my campaign was centered on reminding people that if Europe was worth five cents as a union, then it should be able to take decisions concerning its own borders and where they would cease, uh, rather than relying on some neighbor uh, telling them where they thought this neighborhood should be. Well, the very same principle has continued after uh, the admission uh, of the Baltic countries uh, and the enlargements that included already part uh, of the Balkans. Uh, Croatia was a shining example of a country. Slovenia, similarly, uh, were countries that were ready to join the European uh, Union in the southeast, but there were other countries that were not ready and I suppose will not be ready for a while yet. But for those of us who are limitrope, who are on the limits, uh, on the, if you like, the outer borders on the northeastern or southeastern side, we, more than anybody else in Europe, care about who our next and immediate neighbors are, and not just the immediate ones, but the ones that one or two or three countries even further beyond, because we see that we have either historical links with them, uh, or similar values, uh, or similar aims uh, and desires uh, to keep our countries independent from foreign occupation and uh, um, progressing, uh, economically progressing on the path to true democracy and to the rule of law. And we, who are, if you like, inside the club, are certainly extremely interested in doing everything we possibly can politically uh, economically, with, with, with human contacts, uh, to get as many other countries uh, to follow the same sort of philosophy of life 
the same kind of systems of go democratic governance, the same kinds of values uh, that we hold dear, regardless of whether technically we belong to a political union such as the European Union or not. I think that is the crucial question. Th thank you. Um, if I may uh, follow up uh, with the question to the uh, former president of Croatia, Dio Kolinga, uh, uh, and then bringing the Western Balkans uh, dimension into it. Uh, European prospect perspective um, is something that is acknowledged, not only uh, to those countries that are hopefully soon uh, uh, launching the accession process in the Western Balkans, but then for those who already obviously enjoyed that uh, perspective uh, when it comes to the integration into the European Union. Would you think that uh, European Union lost a bit of an edge with uh, prolongation of that process? How credible that promise is uh, perceived uh, in the region now? Uh, we've seen uh, controversial proposals that came uh, recently when it comes to the uh, non paper, to the way forward on Bosnia Herzegovina, for example, as it is being uh, talked about even from one of the members of the European Union uh, who could be standing uh, behind that vision uh, for the future of Bosnia Herzegovina. What is your assessment? Uh, is, is this promise as attractive as it has been? But not only that, but credible when it comes to, to feasibility of that as perceived by the political class and by the societies in Western Balkans. Well, first of all, hello everyone. And uh, it's an honor to be on this panel. Thank you for this question. This is, uh, I think, the question of utmost importance uh, by lagging behind and in not keeping up with the promises on part of the European Union to reward the progress that has been made by aspiring countries. And we're now focusing on the so-called Western Balkans, which I prefer to call Southeast Europe because of the connotations of the war Balkans. Um, ultimately, uh, I, I believe that, you know, nobody wants um, the uh, that connotation of war, <laughs> dissipation and instability as part of their own house. So I do prefer to call it by a uh, geographically more neutral name, Southeast Europe. Mm -hmm. So it's crucial that by what I said, uh, lagging behind rewarding these countries, uh, insisting on the fulfillment of criteria, but, sh but which we've seen in practice has not always been the same for everyone. So that sends a, the wrong message in itself. But the whole process has been creating a vacuum, a dangerous vacuum that is being filled by third forces who are not necessarily benevolent when it comes to the future of the region. People are concerned because we have the um, a stabilization and association process that dates back to the year 2000. So it's been 21 years. In the meantime, yes, Croatia has become a full member state in 2013. But ever since, we have been really pressing for our neighboring countries to make a lot more progress because we, and I personally believe in the power of Europeanization in the sense that the criteria for membership provide a blueprint for democratic uh, market and other uh, reforms. And the prospect of membership is a strong catalyst of those reforms. And if you're losing sight of the membership, which for this particular area of Southeast Europe has been defined yet that yes, that the ultimate goal is membership of all these countries in contrast to some of the other uh, Eastern and, and, and Southeastern and MENA neighborhood countries, then you have to follow on and you have to think beyond yourself and the internal uh, disagreements or the internal situation that we have deal have to deal with uh, in the European Union, in uh, particular uh, with uh, respect to uh, the COVID and post-COVID, not just vaccination and the relatively slow process of vaccination, but also economic recovery of all of our countries. Stability doesn't come just from within, it comes from the outside as well. So we need to focus on the stability of the countries who are aspiring for membership or a closer connection with the European Union in any way. 
Um, so we have lost that edge. And I'm afraid that we're losing the hearts and the minds of the people. But they're getting discouraged. And uh, I think rightfully so, because a lot of people tell them, look, no matter what you do, you're still not good enough. You're still not making that progress that we need. And um, from the, my own personal perspective and from the perspective of Croatia, I think it's of crucial importance for all the countries in the neighborhood uh, of Croatia become member states of the European Union. That is the only way that we will achieve lasting stability, peace and prosperity of these countries and that we will secure that part of the European Union and be able towards, uh, to work uh, more towards the East and the Southeast to secure the neighborhood and to be actively involved to the level that these countries are interested in because it has to be a two-way process. Now, you've mentioned the paper that recently circulated on Bosnia and Herzegovina. A lot of people in the European Union focus on the Belgrade-Pristina relationship, uh, Serbia and Kosovo. But I think that actually Bosnia and Herzegovina is a much more of a pressing issue. We have to make the country uh, politically emancipated. We know that there is still the high representative of the international community, that the Peace Implementation Council is very much involved in taking decisions on behalf of Bosnia and Herzegovina. But what I've seen is also uh, dangerous attempts to step away from the Dayton Peace Accords that, uh, of course, were not perfect by, um, you know, when, when we look at the Dayton Peace Accords today, they, there are many flaws, uh, one of them being that in a way they froze the ethnic cleansing lines. But at the time, they were a vehicle to stop the war. And we need to build upon the Dayton Peace Accords and preserve uh, the principles of the equality, not just of citizens, but also of nations, because this is what the country was built on. And we have to accept the case, uh, the, the fact that Bosnia and Herzegovina is uh, a sui generis, a sui generis case in, in the European Union. And also, again, insistent upon fulfilling all the criteria, I think they need a lot more help and assistance in building strong institutions and in working political processes. Uh, for me, what will be of crucial importance for the stability of the whole region is to preserve the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of Bosnia and Herzegovina and work out further political and other solutions that will enable for people and for the nations to really be the ones to decide on the future of their country. But we need to hurry up with that because as I said, dangerous vacuums are being created. And we see influences uh, from the East, uh, from Russia, we see influences from the Islamic world, uh, we see influences from other parts of the world. And uh, you know, uh, the, the termination of the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Kosovo has always been the European Union. So we need to just support that with words. We need to follow with deeds and allow these countries to make formal official progress on the steps to full European to full membership of the European Union in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll continue with the Rose uh, with you, uh, former president of Bulgaria. Uh, and um, you are in the unique position in so many ways when you when when looking into all all, all of these directions that we're talking geographically. Uh, Bulgaria is uh, is uh, in the middle of it when it comes to the interests of your own country and influence. Obviously, that policies of Bulgaria and with that uh, efforts uh, could bring uh, to the discourse. What was your um, uh, perception of? Um, of those struggles inside of uh, Brussels, so to say, if we would generalize that with one word, of diversity of those interests. Uh, Her Excellency uh, Devira identified very clearly how uh, essential proper, not only neighborhood policies, but enlargement policies for countries like Baltic countries, Latvia in that case, 
has always been when it comes to enlarging that that depth of stability and scale of that and bringing to life this whole idea of Europe whole, free and at peace and to the reality. Uh, how much uh, in your experience as well, that was a struggle to have a holistic approach to that commonality of you in this direction. And then, and then in this regard, if one looks into the direction of Southeast Europe and into the direction of Black Sea, one suddenly feels that there is not to the fullest uh, an understanding that this is not only neighborhood of Europe, but it is Europe. And this is already part of what Europe is in, in 21st century. Um, do you think that in this regard to have more of a leap forward, strategically speaking, renewal of transatlantic cooperation with the new administration of the US is rather essential to strengthen perhaps that, that visionary approach to how Europe whole free and at peace needs more effort and strategic approach to it and not just perhaps bureaucratic understanding of the processes uh, that are underpinning any progress of any country in the direction of the EU for that matter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very happy to be on such a distinguished panel. Actually, uh, uh, a lot of questions you asked. I will be uh, trying to be uh, very open and, and frank in my answer. First of all, I was the acting president in 2014 when Europe at peace, our dream about giving to our children, peace and prosperity was blown and the very foundations of peace have been deinstalled. They have been blown by the president of Russia, Putin, with the illegal annexation of Crimea. Uh, I saw as an acting president how on all the Russian neighborhood, we saw uh, frozen conflicts uh, being uh, installed by Russia, very dangerous game. Uh, and a lot of countries have been long-term destabilized. Uh, and that's not what you expect from a country that is a member of the Permanent Council of the United Nations Security Council and a strong country that would bring peace and prosperity by respecting the others who are not as strong as they are. So the very foundation, the Helsinki principle, the Helsinki Accords of Peace do not, are not valid anymore, and this is a very big drum. We see a new phase of uh, power politics, a new phase of confrontation, geopolitics is coming back, and this is not good for Europe that has to be at peace because a great generation of European politicians, founding fathers of what Europe is today, they believed that we should go beyond the politics of great powers and everybody should be important, big or small, rich or poor, and everybody, every country in Europe has and should contribute to peace. But peace is only possible if you have rules and institutions that guarantee that the rules are kept. And today there is no rules and we have Russia, and not just Russia, many others, by the way, do not think uh, in those foundations of peace, rules, institutions that have to be upgraded. So in the new, this new phase of development, of course, we see a lot of leveraging. The European Union is trying to increase its leverage in the, the six countries in the Eastern Partnership, also in the other six in what I like very much, what uh, the president of Croatia and my good friend Kolinda was saying, the countries in Southeast Europe. So six and six, 12 countries, and all of them have a special part in the very heart of the European project and should not be left behind, behind the ambitions of all uh, others that could be Kremlin or uh, some other great powers. So the European Union is working hard, but, and it's true, we see a lot of negative trends, but there's a lot of hope, a lot of light. We see that the countries that are into this process, no matter the Eastern partnership, it has been established in 2009 it's 12 years on and it has the same principles and the same goals and they still not achieved on the other side the six countries in southeast europe still thriving for european membership they're not there too so yes you can say those countries are tired their political elites are questioning is that the right direction but on the other side to be very honest the european union is tired too no reforms just look at very simple facts um, Serbia has been a candidate status since 2012, opened accession in 2014, seven years down the road, half of the chapters are not still open and just two are provisionally closed, but not finally closed. If you look at the speed of all the other countries from Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia to 
whoever you can imagine the former communist countries, they've been so fast. There was such a great reform agenda. There was such a great reform willingness and they had an ownership of the process. They were not complaining that somebody is hurting or not helping. They were making reforms and they've done what they had to do for their children. And those countries are prosperous and safe. Even if you look at Bulgaria, Romania, we got our status in 2000 and in 2006 we finalized. So for six years, we changed 5,000 laws, regulations, six years. And today, I'm not just talking about Serbia. You could look also at Montenegro. What really shocked me recently that the ruling pro-Russian uh, now um, party and uh, oppos uh, let's say coalition in Montenegro was trying even to deny the Srebrenica genocide. This is not bringing us uh, forwards. Or for example, in Skopje today, Tito and Stalin are held as heroes. As heroes. Uh, if you look at their books, how they, how they study young people, there is no word against communism uh, that has done something wrong. Um, all the other countries, starting from Hungary, Czech Republic, to Lithuania, Estonia, Bulgaria, Romania, the first thing they've done back in the 90s was to show the truth about the communism so that the next generation could learn from mistakes. And we don't see a very strong reform agenda in these countries, and that's a problem that the European Union is also saying, well, we need to be cautious, we need to be patient, uh, we need to continue building our leverage, uh, and we need to continue working with all those countries because hopefully all those people understand in the 12 countries that, yes, you can compare with Russia and in China and the United States, but it is the European Union who is really a symbol of peace, is a symbol of good governance, is a symbol of human rights. And people understand that. And because of that, the European Union has to support the, the reform agenda of those countries, has to push a new reform agenda and should reform, reward, let's say reward this reform agenda with, uh, with the clear results. Those who are pushing the reforms, the, there is no way for them to be stopped. Uh, and uh, that's why, for example, now I'm, I worry about Albania and North Macedonia. Albania has shown the truth about communism has made uh, a very honest uh, public uh, counting of people, minorities. Albania is pushing forward with a very strong reform agenda. On the other side, it seems to me that uh, Skopje and some other countries are stuck, which is not good. So the European Union has to empower, has to work together. There is also a lot of economic projects available. The Green Deal is offering a great opportunity also for those countries to push in the right direction. Yes, I'm realist. I'm an engineer, not just a president, but I'm positive realist. And I'm positive that uh, those countries will find their reform agenda, will push forward, and they will, nobody will be able to stop them to join this great project of, of peace, the European Union. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, a small remark, perhaps, that I could make from my side. I fully subscribe to what you said, with just only a small caveat that when it comes to the reforms, which are uh, very painful in many countries uh, for any political uh, governments to pull off, which they have to do, no doubt about that, uh, having um, for a continuous period of time ambiguity in terms of what is the next chapter after you achieve what you have to deliver when it comes to further progress um, is not the strongest um, tool in the overall toolboxes of pulling off the reforms when it comes to uh, societies supporting them continuously and fighting back with the vested interest uh, as they are. I see that clearly in Ukraine where I am now. It's, it's a lot of challenges, obviously, that the country faces, not just from the security point of view.